All right, good morning. It's good to have everyone here this morning. And we've got, we've got a good group of folks and uh, always good to have uh, a pavilion with quite a few people in it. That's always good. So it's encouraging. Uh, we've had folks out and about and traveling and doing things. And so we're always glad when uh, uh, people start getting home and, and we're able to have uh, more of our regulars on a more regular basis. So here we are. It's Sunday morning of Labor Day weekend. And so, you know, you're, you're pondering what to teach or what to preach or what kind of message to bring. And so I thought, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about our labor. And uh, so I thought I would uh, do a message on that today. So if you will, follow with me with that a little bit. Uh, History of Labor Day, I've printed out a bunch of stuff. But uh, Labor Day was started really by the labor unions back in the late 1800s. And it was that because at that period of time, you know, as industry began to grow in the, in the big cities and, and they had factory workers and they worked those folks long, long hours. You know, they worked 60, 70, 80, 90 hours a week. They worked them seven days a week. And so there was a whole lot of, of uh, you know, hard labor that was involved. And, of course, you know, the folks out and about, the farm, you know, farm folks, they've always worked hard, worked long hours and, and labored hard. Uh, but the labor unions, in an effort to, uh, uh, pr to recognize the labor force uh, of the country and that which uh, kept the country moving forward, then the labor unions came through and said, we need to have a day that we recognize the labor forces and the working people, especially had it, as it had to do with the factory kind of people that were involved at that time. And so they set aside a day uh, the first day of after the first Monday after uh, you know at the end of October, uh, end of August, first of September. Uh, what am I trying to say? The first Monday of September. Make it real simple, Sam. The first Monday of September. Then they set that aside. And there were several states that began to do this at first. And then, if my record is right, I've got it. It was uh, uh, eight. It was June twenty eighth, eighteen ninety four. Congress passed the act uh, making the first Monday in September of each year a legal federal holiday. And so uh, uh, it, was, it was recognized by parades and, of course, uh, again, the labor unions being much a part of that. The labor unions had floats and, you know, the fire trucks would come out, you know, all the stuff that you do for a parade, and they made a big to-do out of it. And so that's kind of the foundation of Labor Day, and it's been a federal holiday then since uh, the day after my birthday, uh, uh, June 28th of 1894. So uh, we've been doing this for well over 100 years, pushing uh, what? It'll be uh, 130 years, guess, next year. Uh, so as we think about that. All right. Of course, as we've grown up, Labor Day is it's, uh, it's kind of the last official weekend of summer. We know the calendar doesn't give us the end of summer till later on, but, but in our minds, I know I'm of a generation and most of you are of a generation that, you know, the summer break was from Memorial Day to Labor Day. And you were out of school right before Memorial Day, and then you didn't start back school until Tuesday after Labor Day weekend, you know, and that's how we grew up. Of course, now they go to school into June and then they start back early August, and uh, I don't know what they're doing. But they get more breaks in school nowadays. Uh, but at any rate, uh, so that's kind of, you know, what we think about when it comes to Labor Day. Uh, as we celebrate Labor Day, it's again, it's a day off work. It's the last big weekend of the summer. Uh, we enter in, we're entering into what they call the Burr months, uh, September and October, November, <coughs> I guess because they're anticipating it getting cold, Burr. Uh, and so they talk about that, but we associate it with, uh, you know, barbecues and the lake and of course for us, horseback riding and, and the change. What's that? Potluck. Potluck. Yeah, we do the potluck and, uh, uh which last night we had the potluck here and it was, we celebrate 20 years of the Spruce Creek Trail Association last night. And so, uh, that's a good thing. And so we think about all those things when it comes to Labor Day. And then we're mindful of that, and so we enjoy it. And, uh, and so the next, I guess, big holiday will be uh, Thanksgiving, I suppose. Uh, the big, 
What's that? Halloween. Yeah, Halloween comes up. Uh, but uh, the you know I think I, I don't ever pay attention to Halloween. But uh, the next big holiday in my mind is Thanksgiving, and so we have those things coming along. And so, what's that? Oh, do his birthday. Oh, yeah, that's always a big deal to do his birthday. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I didn't forget that. And uh, so there you go. All right. So uh, as we begin this morning, we're going to start in Genesis 3. And uh, we're going to move through some things as we discuss this idea of labor. Uh, again, most of us are of a generation. We, we just, we've worked our whole lives. And uh, some are of a generation that are here now that are retired. Uh, but uh, some of us are still working. And so we think back over the years that we've worked. I, I think my first official job was I was about 11 years old, and, and uh, my step-grandfather at the time had a gas station in Claremore, Oklahoma, and a, a real gas station. Back in the days when they had the, the air bell, you know, when they'd pull up and you'd check the oil and and uh, pump the gas and check the tires and wash the windshields. And so as an 11-year-old uh, kid, uh, I, I had the privilege of working and doing that. I can remember the first time I found out that a uh, Volkswagen's motor was in the rear and that a Volkswagen didn't have a, uh, a radiator. Uh, first time I learned that was working at my grandfather's gas station. And my dad and my grandfather told me to go out and uh, uh, check, the, check the radiator in that car. And uh, so I go out there and that beetle bug and I push that button and I open it up in the front and there's nothing there. <laughs> and so they're back there laughing and so then I look around and well there's, there's vents on the back of that trunk and so I go, you know, the back end. So I go back there and open it up and I'm looking everywhere uh, for a radiator. And I go inside. They're standing inside the door, grinning and giggling at each other, you know, and watching me. And, uh, and so I said, y'all going to have to show me where the radiator is. And so they came out there and they explained to me that it was, they didn't have radiators. And so, uh, and some of y'all are scratching your heads about that. But, uh, yeah, back in those days, the Volkswagen Beetle didn't have a, didn't have a radiator. I don't know if they do now or not. I have no idea. But anyway, uh, so they had a big joke. But that was my first job. And really, I have worked at something most of my life since then. Uh, I've never been without a job if I wanted one. Uh, there's been a lot of jobs I've had that I didn't like. Uh, and uh, But, you know, uh, you work. And that's just how we were brought up. That's just what you did. You just worked. And it wasn't about liking the job. You, you had a responsibility. You worked. And you got up and you went. And you, you felt like it, you worked. You didn't feel like it, you worked. You liked your job, you worked. You loved your job, you worked. And so that was just kind of part of life growing up uh, in the years that I grew up. And for most of you, I'd say that's true. People will ask me sometimes, the older I get and the grayer my hair gets and uh, I'll go out and working, I still work my job a couple of days a week, and I'll be out doing that, and folks will say, Sam, when are you going to retire? And I'll say, well, and let's say it's a Monday, and I'll say, well, it's Monday. I could retire Thursday as long as I die by Monday. <laughs> and then I say, you know, if I... Uh, if I got out of horses and I sold horses and I sold my truck and I sold my trailer and all the stuff having to do with our horses, we might have put that off for, you know, two or three more months and then I'd have to die. And uh, so that's really the reality of, of uh, my work life. And uh, so there it is. And so we understand the idea of work and uh, we have Adam to blame for that. And so we can go back to Genesis chapter three if you found your way there. And again, reading at verse 17, and while the word work or, or labor is not necessarily in the text where we're starting, yet the idea, of course, is there. But uh, as Adam and Eve had sinned and God was dealing with them, God told Adam in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, 
He says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And so he talks about the thorns and the thistles. He talks about uh, have in sorrow you shall eat of it all the days of your life. He talks about verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread and uh, until you return into the ground. And so the idea of, of work and man doing labor and having to work for his livelihood, have to work for his food and have to work to provide for himself, uh, that idea of labor was established way back there in Genesis chapter 3. Of course, as we carry on and we're talking about labor and folks working, you know, there's help wanted signs everywhere, isn't there? And you wonder today why uh, folks don't work. Well, we could get into a political conversation, couldn't we? And uh, uh, people are being paid not to work. And uh, uh, But Paul said, and just kind of throwing this in as it passes through my mind, Paul made the statement, if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. And so you tie that in all the way back with Adam. Adam had to work in the sweat of his brow to provide for himself and for his family. And Paul, so many thousand years later, said, if a man won't work, neither should he eat. And so I'm very much about workfare, not welfare, right? And so that'll preach. But again, that's a political message, and we'll move along, won't we? All right. Now go with me, if you will, to Exodus chapter 20. We're just going to touch a few bases as we make our way through some scripture. And so in Exodus chapter 20, if you're mindful, we say that Exodus 20, in your mind you ought to be thinking, oh, that's where the Ten Commandments are put in scripture. Exodus 20. And so uh, let that be one of those things that you remember. Somebody says, go to Exodus chapter 20, your mind identifies that's where God gave the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel. And so as we look at that in Exodus chapter 20, we're going to read at verse 8. And uh, spend a, full, a moment here. And so in Exodus 20, verse 8, Moses writing to the children of Israel, recording there the words of God. Verse Chapter 20, verse 1, it says, God spake all these words, saying, So it's God Almighty there on Mount Sinai giving these things to Moses. Moses writes them down and gives them to the children of Israel. And so again in verse 8, Exodus chapter 20, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt, do, shalt not do any work, uh, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy, thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And so, again, this is where God gave the Sabbath to the people of Israel. Today, we don't have a Sabbath. One man seemed of one day above another. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Every day is the same. We don't have a Sabbath. We meet on Sunday mornings because that's our habit. That's our tradition. I believe that they. I believe that the early church met on a Sunday, uh, and we could go into that again. That's a lesson for another day. Uh, but we, there's no Sabbath in this dispensation of the grace of God. There's no day set aside that man is told, like God told uh, the children of Israel here, that they work six days, but they have to rest on the seventh day. If you keep reading about the law given to Moses. Uh, this thing becomes very severe. He makes it through. He gets through there, and, and God tells Israel through Moses later on as he continues to write the law that if a man worked on the Sabbath day, he was worthy of death. And so this thing with Israel's Sabbath was a very serious thing. Uh, God set that Sabbath aside for the people of Israel. And again, God's not dealing with Israel as a nation today. He's getting given into dealing with according to law. He's dealing with individuals according to his grace. But, again, the point I'm wanting to see here 
is that God established this idea that it's uh, certainly of God that men work. So in verse 9 he says, Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. So even for Israel under the law, they, they had a six-day work week. And if they were going to work, they had to get it all done in that six days. And uh, because on the seventh day was their Sabbath unto the Lord. All right, so we see that God established uh, the idea of labor, the idea of work there in Genesis. Now go with me all the way over to the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes. If you can find <coughs> Psalms, Proverbs, then you can find Ecclesiastes because it's Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Psalms is about the middle of your Bible. Find that. Turn your way to your right or scroll in your device and uh, punch in the ECCL or whatever to get it there and go to the book of Ecclesiastes. As I was doing this, you know, I like to look at the numbers and and uh, the, lab, the word labor is used 128 times in, in 128 verses in our Bible, 82 verses in the Old Testament, 46 in the New Testament. In the book of Ecclesiastes, which was written by King David's son, King Solomon, uh, it's used 24 times. So Solomon uses the word labor uh, more than any other writer in the Old Testament. We just want to hit a few places there uh, before we move into uh, uh, the New Testament portion of our Bible. And so as we're there, we're going to start in Exodus chapter 1. Let's just read the first three verses. Excuse me, thank you. Not Exodus, Ecclesiastes. That's what your wife is for, to keep you straight. That's good. Thank you, baby. All right. So Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. We're with the first three verses as we begin here. He says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, Vanity of vanities, all is vanities. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? And so he starts that thing right there. Everything's vanity. What profit hath a man have? And uh, what a man, what profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? Probably the key phrase of Ecclesiastes is that under the sun. So he's talking about just life on this ball of mud as he writes through the book of Ecclesiastes and the things that he learned and he's sharing and putting down here. What profit hath a man of all his labors which he taketh under the sun? Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And we'll look at several verses here. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Look at verse 10 and 11 of Ecclesiastes chapter 2. He says in verse 10 and 11, And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. So as Solomon writes this, he says, Look, I worked, and I gathered, and I labored, and I didn't withhold anything from myself, and I gathered things in, and I put things together. But when it was all said and done, with everything that I had gained from all of my labor under the sun, it was all vanity, vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Kind of discouraging thing is that Solomon writes that. Look at verse 18. Look at verse 18 of Ecclesiastes chapter 2. He says, Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that should be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. Uh, let's see, there, verse 20. Therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is in wisdom and in knowledge and in equity, yet to it, and yet to a man that has not labored therein, shall he leave it for his portion. This also is vanity, vanity and a great evil. 
For what hath man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart when he hath labored under the sun? For all his days are sorrows and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This is also vanity. And so he talks about the man who labors his whole life and gathers all this stuff and, 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 and pro provides all this store of things from his labor and then he's concerned about, well, who's going to get this when I'm not here anymore and what are they going to do with it? And certainly that is a vanity and a vexation of spirit. Of course, now folks have the mind and, and I kind of uh, am supportive of the idea is, is uh, and you see the memes on Facebook and the things is, you know, I'm out, I'm out spending my children's inheritance. You know, <laughs> uh, go out and enjoy life. Well, I can't spend that. I can't do that. I got to leave it to my kids. No, you don't. Go out and enjoy your life. And so that's what the, uh, if you leave your kids something, that's wonderful. But uh, don't hold it up just to give to your kids. And then, of course, just in passing, as I think about that, uh, you see, I saw a meme the other day, and it showed an older couple. And it looked like they were probably uh, somewhere in Venice, maybe Italy, somewhere. And they're on one of those little gondola boat things. <coughs> And they're on the river, and there's a guy standing there, and he's got the stick, you know, pushing the boat. These folks have worked all of their lives to go take a trip to Italy and ride in one of those boats down one of those canals. And you know what these two old folks are doing? They're sound asleep in the boat. Yeah. They're sound asleep in the boat. And so I'd also say... Uh, while you're laboring, go and enjoy that. Take a vacation from time to time. Go enjoy that and spend some of that money. Because as Solomon writes, here's this guy of all his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? He said, this is also vanity. Yea, it's sore prevail. So here's the guy that's working. He can't get enough, but he's just by himself. Verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth. For he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together for a common goal and a common purpose to accomplish a common thing, and they do much better together uh, than they do apart. As I've often said, I don't know where I'd be uh, without my wife uh, along my side. And so... Uh, uh, anyway, there you go. All right. Uh, chapter 5 of Ecclesiastes. Let's look at a couple of verses here. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Begin at verse 10. It says, verse 10 of Ecclesiastes 5. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with the increase. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. This is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. But those riches perish by evil travail, and he begetteth the sun, and, and there is nothing in his hand. As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return uh, to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor, which he, had, which he may carry away in his hand. And this also is a sore evil, that in all points as he came, so shall he go. And what profit hath he that hath labored for the wind? All his days also he eateth in darkness, and he hath much sorrow and wrath with his sickness." Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and, and comely for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor, that is the gift of God. For he shall not much remember the days of his life I answereth him, and the joy of his heart. And so in here we get several things. One, to labor and to enjoy the things for which you've labored. That's a good thing. But notice again what it says. 
and carry on and go farther. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Look at drop in at verse 9 and 10. Live the days of thy life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun, all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life, and thy labor which thou takest under the sun. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no purpose. He's talking about a, a physical field out there to go out and do the harvest and labors to go into the harvest. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a spiritual field. And he's talking about a spiritual harvest. And certainly he was talking to the disciples and those of Israel specifically there about the ministry. And he says, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are, fruit, are few. And he says, pray ye therefore the Lord of harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And so while the direct thing there is concerning going to Israel and reaching them with that kingdom gospel, we can pull that out and make an application for us today uh, that the, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. We can look around this world and the words of Jesus and the things that we can apply there and we're familiar with that and then turn the page to Matthew 11 Matthew 11 and we'll look at the end of the last three verses of Matthew 11 again these are familiar passages of scripture Matthew 11 28, 29, 30 come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy, heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So again, Jesus preaching and teaching in his ministry to Israel. And yet we can make some application there. Come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Folks are out there laboring in religion. They're working hard to get to heaven. They're trying their best to make sure that when they die, they'll be accepted of God. And yet we know that no man cometh unto the Father but through Jesus Christ. We know that a man that can, can be saved by grace through faith but without any work or effort of our own, simply by trusting and resting in the fact that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised again according to the Scriptures. We can find rest into our souls. Uh, we can trying to get to heaven when we realize He was delivered for our offenses, was raised again for our justification, and we can be justified simply by faith, trusting the finished work of life Christ alone. And so He says, Come unto Me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. All right. Now, go with me to Acts. Acts chapter 20. I said that uh, the writer... <laughs> meeting first at Acts 20 and then we'll work our way till we run out of time uh, passages where Paul talks about labor as it relates to us and so we know labor is certainly a, a biblical thing the idea of work is certainly all through the scriptures uh, we know that that's a part of our life and we've all worked hard through our lives or are working hard even today uh, to get to that place where we are and uh, so at any rate, labor's of just a fact of life and for all of us under the sun. But we get to Paul and, there, and Paul said uh, 30 verses. In 30 verses, Paul uses uh, the word labor and expresses the word labor. And so Solomon spoke of it more in the Old Testament and Paul speaks more of it in uh, what we call the New Testament. Let's begin at Acts chapter 20. And in Acts chapter 20, again, mindful uh, that's one of those chapters that something clicks in our head. In Acts chapter 20 is where Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. He says, I'm going to go there, verse 24, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He's called the Ephesian elders together, and he's sharing some things and giving them some instructions before he makes his way to Jerusalem. In Acts 21, he gets arrested, and uh, so on from there. But as we again hear at verse 33 through 30, talking to the Ephesian elders, he says at verse 33, he says, and they drew uh, Alexander, no, I'm in the wrong, I'm in 19, I'm sorry, turn the page, Sam, Acts 20, verse 33. Paul says, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel, yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. 
I have showed you all things, how that soul laboring, you ought to some job or he'd work whatever he had to work, but he worked to provide for uh, the folks that were with him and he worked to provide for himself. And he said that Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. So he worked to support the weak. And certainly that's part of why we labor. We don't labor just to amass for ourselves, but we labor so that we have wherewithal so we can help others and meet the needs of others who have, who have difficulties or have needs in their life. Don't you love a big noisy diesel truck? <laughs> All right. And so... Uh, and so that's what Paul said there about his own laboring, laboring to support the weak. Uh, go with me now to Romans 16. And Paul calls attention to labor. And sometimes Paul's talking about physical labor like he did there in Acts chapter 20. And uh, other places he's talking about uh, spiritual labor, the labor of the ministry. And so we'll just, again, walk our way through some of this until we run out of time. In Romans chapter 6, Excuse me, 16, Romans chapter 16. Let's just begin at verse 1, Romans 16, verse 1. Paul says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church at Sincrea, that you receive her in the Lord as become a saint, and that you assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succour of many, and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila at my head. <laughs> Sorry about that, Siri. Uh, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Eponidas, who is the firstfruits of Achaia unto Christ. Verse 6, greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Adronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, uh, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ. And, and Stechus, my beloved. Salute Apellus, approved of Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus' household. Salute Herodian, my kinsmen. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus which are in the Lord. Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother mine, and mine. Salute Asenocritus, Phlegon, Hermas, I know I'm butchering these, these, these names, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philologus and Julia, and aren't you glad you didn't live back in those days? <laughs> Nereus and his sister Olympus and all the saints uh, which are with them salute one another with a holy kiss. The church of Christ salutes you. In verse 6, he talks about Mary who bestowed much labor on us. Verse 12, he talks about Tryphena and Tryphosus and uh, Persis who labored much in the Lord. And so you got a physical labor going on. Mary, who bestowed much labor on us, took care of Paul and those that were with him and worked to provide uh, for them, probably cooked for them and fed them and maybe cleaned up after them, washed their clothes. And then you got these folks who worked with them, labored with them in the ministry. And I wanted to read all through that. For time's sake, I probably shouldn't have. But I wanted to read all through there because aren't there a lot of names in there? A bunch of names. And I always like to point out when we read through Romans 16 and get in there, uh, it, it's encouraging to me that God took the time to record in Scripture the names, the individual names of these folks. Do you think God might know about who you are? Do you think God might know your name? For me, that's a comforting thing to know. God took time to record in the pages of Scripture this book, Romans, written by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, God took time to put all these names in here, record something about these folks, because that is an encouragement to me that uh, if God knew these folks, He knows us. And, and it's not a corporate thing that He knows the group. He knows the individuals. And He makes note of those like Mary who bestowed much labor on us. And we think about those who, 
who do work for us and do things to care for us on a physical way. And then he talks about these folks in verse 12 who labored in the Lord and labored much in the Lord. And so we know the folks who labor in physical things to care for folks and to meet folks' need, to just do things for folks who labor. And we know folks who labor in the ministry. And so we pray, dear God, I want to be somebody who labors to help people. And I want to be someone who labors to minister to people in the ministry. And so hopefully we can learn something there about that as it comes to labor. Labor doesn't have to be a four-letter word, does it? Work, the four-letter word. It doesn't have to be a dirty word. It can be a good word. And it can be a word of which we can be a part of in our ministry and our relationship with others and uh, as we go about the work of the ministry. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And just drop in at verse uh, 8 and 9. 1 Corinthians 3, 8 and 9. It says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. And so the idea there is with our ministry, there will come a day. You keep reading through 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we, and we know that there's coming a day where our work, our labor in this life, as it relates to our relationship with God, that labor will either be gold, silver, precious stone that will uh, endure the fire of, uh, of, of uh, being purged, or it will be wood, hay, and stubble. And so as we stand before the Lord, it's what's called the judgment seat of Christ. We're not given account for our sins. Our sins was dealt with by the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. But we do give an account of our labor, our ministry, our work, what we've done in this life uh, to go about the ministry. And so we want that to be gold, silver, precious stone and not wood, hay, and stubble. We want the labor of our ministry to be that which honors and pleases the Lord according to the Word of God. And so he says right there at verse 8 again, Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, and ye are God's building. Go to 2 Corinthians. Oh, no, go with me. Excuse me. 1 Corinthians 15. Let's hit there quick before we move along and begin to wrap things up. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we just drop in at verse 10. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Paul says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And so Paul talks about his labor. Paul says, I worked harder and I worked more abundantly and I labored more than any of those who came before me. He said, I labored more than Peter, James, or John. He said, I labored much more. And uh, so he says that very plainly there. And he says that labor was not in vain, uh, but, uh, and he says it wasn't him, but the grace of God that was with him. Now look at verse, uh, uh, the end of the chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, 58, encouragement here. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, 58. He says, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So he encourages us to be faithful, to be busy about the ministry, to don't get weary in well-doing as we go about the labor, the work of the ministry. Uh, as you go about trying to reach others with the gospel, as you go about trying to reach others with the truth of the word of God, uh, sometimes it becomes work. Sometimes it, it's really a difficult thing. How am I going to reach my son? How am I going to reach my daughter? How am I going to reach my parents with the gospel? And it becomes work as to how we're going to do that. It's a labor, but it's a labor of love. And so we're busy about that. As we try to work and show people the truth of the Word of God and get them out of their religion and their tradition and get them to understanding the Word of God rightly divided, that can be work. You sit down and you talk to someone or you either sharing the gospel or you're sharing the scriptures and about the time you think they got it, they don't. 
about the time you think that the light has come on, then they say something or do something that tells you they don't. And so you're back at it again, and it can be frustrating. It can be uh, 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 it can it can really lead to uh, some irritation and so on, and some disappointment. And so Paul tells us, "Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain." In the Lord. I've got several of the references, but uh, I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop. But the idea here, I think, is as we think about labor, this Labor Day weekend, and I'll bring the thoughts to an end here, is that while labor has always been a part of mankind's life uh, since Adam uh, was told he had to work and earn his living and feed himself by the sweat of his brow, uh, ever since Moses codified it for Israel to work six days, uh, even as Ecclesiastes wrote, <laughs> man's life is full of labor and it can be a vexation under the sun. It can bring pleasure, but it can bring difficulty. Uh, the caution of the balance about labor as we read through that in Ecclesiastes. And then we get to where Paul, where Jesus spoke and then Paul wrote, that certainly we are to be about the labor of our life and our labor in our efforts so that we can have to give to meet our own needs and to give to support and meet the needs of others. But the most important labor that we have is our labor in the ministry. To be about the work of the ministry. And indeed, it can be a work. To be mindful of that and conscious of that. To be always uh, gainfully employed, so to speak in the labor of the ministry and the labor of the work. And you can, uh, again, you can use a concordance or you can use the app in your device and you can type in that word labor and uh, using a King James Bible, you got to spell it the old English way, L-A-B-O-U-R, uh, to find the word in your King James Bible. And uh, and you can search that word out and, and do a even more full study than what we did here this morning. But I just wanted us to be mindful of our labor in the Lord on this Labor Day weekend. And so be about that because that's the most important thing. Ecclesiastes wrote about the labor under the sun, and, uh, and that doesn't go with you. Uh, but the labor we do in the ministry, uh, that's an eternal value, and that's a labor that goes with us. Uh, that's the gold, silver, precious stone of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right, very good. Let's have a word of prayer. And we'll sing our song and be dismissed. Uh, Brother Hank, would you dismiss this place? Lord, thank you for this day and this opportunity to come together to study your word. That fill our hearts and minds as we move through this week. Help us to be about the labor of your commission. That we bring others to know you. All these many things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy trails to you. Until we meet again, happy trails to you. Keep smiling until then. Who cares about the clouds when we're together? Just sing a song and bring the sunny weather. Happy trails to you. Till we meet again. Thank you again for your attention.